we have a panel that I asked if I could lead. Uh, and, and there's a reason. Uh, I think that all of you have been much too timid uh, in thinking about the kind of resources, thank you so much, uh, you need uh, to get this work done. Uh, there is, in my mind, a vision of uh, what we have to have as organizations if you're going to fulfill a promise from cradle to career. Now, you all were here when you saw uh, those two folks from the Harlem Children's Zone uh, say that they started with the program 22 years ago. We've got a bunch of one-year-olds that expect us to be with them 22 years from now. Now, we made a promise that we're going to be there. And I'm, I'm, Kwame's probably going to get upset. Jen may get a little upset with me because I'm going to talk a little bit about business we never talk about. We built an organization that if we didn't get another dime, we would be there 20 years from now. Uh, we intentionally created something that we thought would ensure that those young people, by the thousands, would have a resource in their community decades from now. Whether the economy is up or down, whether there's a recession or a depression, our kids, we're going to provide for them. And this was a plan. This wasn't an accident. Uh, this was a plan. Uh, and we're not the only ones who did the plan. Uh, you know, I know Michael McAfee, is Michael still here? He may, he may have uh, taken off uh, on PolicyLink. I'm on his board. He talked about, right? What did he say they're raising? They're looking for $300 million? Did you all hear that? I've been on that board before Michael was hired. There was a point we were talking about trying to raise $500,000 as a reserve. You see the difference? He's talking about $300 million. Twelve years ago, we were talking about, can we figure out how to get $500,000? This kind of thinking uh, is what we need if you're really serious about this work, right? If you're really serious about being there for your children and families for real, uh, we got to change your way of thinking about the resources necessary to get this job done uh, and the talent and the strategies it takes to do this work. Uh, so. Uh, it's early in the morning for me to be yelling at you all. I apologize. <laughs> it's true, but, but, but I, I, you know, I have a vision. I mean, I do. What I want for you, what we have. That's what I want for you. I want five years from now for everybody to be saying, oh, yeah, 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 no, no, no. Uh, we got the, we just crossed that 50 million threshold. We're heading to 100 million. We're going to make sure. That thinking like that and executing, that's what this is about. That's what this panel is about this morning. They can help you get there. So forget Othello. We know you got to get an accident. These folks are going to help you get there. If Othello don't come through for you, uh, they're going to help you out. All right? So uh, focus on this. All right? Let's get serious. All right. So, uh, so, so you're going to say, OK, who do we, who do we have here? Uh, first, we, we've got uh, our current uh, uh, head of development, uh, Jennifer Klein, and I'm going to I'm going to ask each person uh, to say a little bit about uh, why they got involved in this work and how they think about the work as I introduce them. So we're going to start with Jennifer, uh, whom I've known for quite a long time. Thanks, Jeff. Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, so I'm a happenstance career fundraiser. I did not go to college saying I wanted to be a fundraiser. I didn't know that was a career. Um, I did it to bridge what I thought was a gap before going off to um, get a medical degree and was fortunate to land in a hospital where I decided the medical career that I had thought I wanted wasn't it and I fell in love with fundraising. Um, I spent about seven years in the medical uh, healthcare arena, and I felt really good about what I was doing, but I was a bit distant from the work. Um, and admittedly, I got a call from our previous chief development officer asking me if I wanted to come learn more about HCZ. I did not know what HCZ was. I did not know who Jeff Canada was. It's embarrassing to say that in front of this room. Um, I went up. I went about two, three times. I spent 30 minutes with Jeff, and I was sold. 
And it was in that period as a fundraiser that I really saw how impactful the work I do, kind of using my powers for good, could be on tens of thousands of children every single year. And I realized I sit where I do because of the opportunities of education, and there's no reason all those other kids in the country and the world shouldn't have those opportunities. And so for me, being here is so much more than fundraising. Um, it's being part of this team, it's seeing what we're accomplishing, and um, it's just a joy to do this every day. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, Teresa Wilkie. And you know, I have, a, I have another plan for you all, <laughs> which is uh, we had the Secretary of Education here we have, we have unprecedented amounts of federal dollars that I know President Biden did this for us. And in the back of their mind, like, how can we help? So we're going to make sure the resources are there. But boy, getting those dollars, uh, being able to write those grants, and be, it's, it's almost impossible. We, we couldn't do it at HCZ uh, without real help. Uh, but Teresa uh, runs, uh, she's the owner and principal of Silver, Silver Arrow Strategies, and I'm going to ask her to just sort of say how you got into this work uh, and what your uh, plans are for our assembly here. Yeah, great. Um, well, I do this work because this is my role in the movement. Um, I'm an introverted, persuasive writer. I was doing communication strategies in the Clinton administration and um, was writing proposals. I got into grant writing because I realized I could move resources with that persuasive writing, and I'm competitive and I like to win. Um, and so um, I was writing, and the, the where I was really struck my purpose in this was 2014, I was writing in St. Louis um, about racial inequities and infant mortality and when Michael Brown was killed. Um, and so when I was in community and in relationship with black healers and activists and organizers, that completely changed and pivoted the way I wrote about structures and systems in 2014. And I was also invited into spaces where people were talking about a healed future and a way to get there. And I wanted to be a part of that movement. And I was invited into that movement by people like Charlie Cooksey and Starsky Wilson and Rebecca Bennett and Bethany Johnson Jawan. I named them because they were so generous with me and generous in pulling me in. Um, and so I started writing and just moving money as fast as I could and as much as I could into movement work and then realized that also in anchor institutions that I was writing for, we could start in integrating that into structural systems change so it became a collective impact and, and, and organizing a combination. Um, and so writing like that and um, being able to push money both in terms of into community and also impacting the way big grants are written, um, I realized I did it whenever the... Um, pandemic hit, I wrote like I was running out of time, like I could not write fast enough. And so working with organizations like Harlem Children's Zone and Strive Together, we realized that I, you know, we need to replicate, we need to disseminate, and um, more people need to know how to access this funding and more people, and there's hundreds of federal programs um, in addition to what's happening right now. There's so much to align with the Cradle to Career Pipeline. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, we, got, we got plans, <laughs> plan. we're gonna get into those plans, but we got plans. Uh, but this next person, you know, I thought I knew a lot about development and fundraising and all the different strategies and avenues until I met Andrea uh, <laughs> LeVere. She started talking about something I'd never heard of before, and I am such a big fan now. Uh, she is president and emerita of Prosperity Now, uh, and she not only has plans for us, she has plans for the nation, but I'm going to just ask her to introduce herself and say a little bit about why you uh, got involved in the work you're doing, and then explain what that work is uh, for uh, the uh, assemblage. So thank you, Jeff. Uh, and it's such a privilege to be here. Um, I started life as a community organizer in the South, uh, or helping to organize primary health care clinics in Mappalachia and West Tennessee. And over time, I saw them fail, because no one knew how to finance them, and no one knew how to manage them. And so I decided completely radically to go to business school because I felt that people who were focused on economic and social justice could use the management and finance skills uh, in their work. So I spent my first decade doing development finance, economic development finance all over the country. And then I decided if you didn't marry that with policy, transactions alone weren't gonna make change. And that's when I joined what was then Corporation for Enterprise Development, CFED, and then now Prosperity Now, best name change I've ever experienced. <laughs> and, um, but when I joined, 
I was absolutely astonished at how most of our funders violated every rule of finance that I had learned in business school about how you create financially strong and resilient enterprises. And as we'll talk about, nonprofit is an enterprise just like a for-profit. It just has a different tax structure. And what's, who, who said that? Right, yes. <laughs> and what do private investors know is essential to the success of enterprises? Long-term, flexible capital invested in the organization itself, not the kind of 19th century philanthropic practices of short-term, program-driven, restricted capital um, that's addressing risks that in fact don't exist. So when I stepped down as president, where I had spent 30 years focused on wealth inequality and then explicitly racial wealth inequality, I decided to move on to help solve this problem, which on the side, since I had a finance background and I had an extraordinary CFO, I was helping many of my fellow CEOs of nonprofits deal with, and let me just say that these CEOs did not lack power, but they still lacked the ability to restructure how the funding came into their organizations. So I have decided to focus on this issue of enterprise capital and really in the context of how do we recreate 21st century nonprofit capital markets that really fund social outcomes. And I just wanna say, we'll talk about this more, as part of this work I published a blueprint for enterprise capital which describes what this is, how it works, how funders can adapt and others, we'll talk more about that. But it's incredible that two of the folks in this room are two of the case studies in the blueprint. So you heard from Logan Herring yesterday about Reach Riverside. He came up right before this panel to show me what his net assets looked like when he began and what they look like today because of the enterprise and capital investment and we'll talk about related capacity building services that help you understand what's my business model and what's the financial model that's necessary to create a sustainable organization. And Byron Sanders, where are you here? His organization, Big Thought, is another one of the case studies, which really focuses on how do you scale when you're changing your business model over time? So that's my short, modest goal. All right, uh, get ready. I'm, I'm just saying, uh, it's, no, it's not an accident uh, that uh, I stumbled on to both of these folks recently. I mean, I'm just like, you know, it's like, how did that, well, it happened because uh, this is basically for you. I hope you, I hope you all are hearing that we're trying to create another revolution in this work, right? And uh, I think these, this group can help us do it. Uh, but one of the first things I want to deal with is the myth of who can raise money and who can't raise money. And I'm going to come right to Jennifer because when I, when I started going around the country, folks were like, oh, yeah, yeah, of course you can raise money. You're Jeff Canada, and you've been on Oprah, and all. Yeah, I've been on Oprah three times. You know what the combined, <laughs> wait, 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 Let, let's get there. You know what the combined amount of money that was raised from those three shows? Maybe $1,500. I'm being serious. Y'all think I'm kidding. Jennifer knows. There isn't no money coming from that. That's not, that's not how this is done. Mm -hmm. People think that's, that's what the advantage is. They're like, oh, yes, you got Stan Druckenmill. Like, he's the only billionaire in the world. <laughs> this is not, look, uh, part of this is a science. Yes. And most folks have not been exposed to the level of talent it takes to execute this talent. And Jennifer knows we had a development person, when we started our business plan and I looked at the money we had to raise, and you know what I said? You can't help me get there. He never forgave me for that. But I don't care because I found someone, uh, Jen's uh, sort of boss, who actually knew how to do this stuff, knew the science of this. It took a lot of hard work. 
But Jen, uh, you know what it takes to sort of grind through this development and build a team. Uh, could you say a little bit about uh, sort of the infrastructure necessary to really uh, help an organization raise that kind of capital? Absolutely. Um, so it's obviously a joy and a privilege to get to work with a Jeff Canada, but I've been at many places that don't have a Jeff Canada, and we've still raised money. And so I think the first thing I'd say is think about how many nonprofits across this country raise significant funds. And there's probably a small percentage that have someone like Jeff leading that charge. And that's where a really top-notch best practice development shop comes into play. And a strategy in using your team. And when I say team, that's where you're going to dig into your development folks. You're going to dig into your CEO, your program leads, and your board. And while you may not have a singular person who's going to go out and raise hundreds of millions of dollars, if you assemble the right team, you're going to be extremely successful. And I've had experience doing that at smaller organizations. Um, from a development perspective, you know, look, you can go out and ask for a gift. Get that gift. Come home. You're thrilled about it. That's just the beginning, and I think that's where sometimes people forget. There's a ton more work, especially if you're going for it, and we all in this room should be going for multi-year commitments. They're critical to sustainability. And sustaining a five-year commitment is a huge task, and it's not one that your CEO or, frankly, even your CDO should be spending extensive time on, and that's where you need a strong team um, managing your grants. That's the first and foremost, a great person who can keep all of your grants in one place, who understands what the timeline, the reporting looks like, can work really well with your finance teams, your program teams, and your evaluations teams. And I say that to also say those are really key pieces of the infrastructure, finance, evaluations, communications, and marketing. They all need to work in tandem with development to create a system by which funders feel really confident in what you can do and what you are doing. Evaluation obviously is gonna show that impact. Your reports need to show impact. Funders want to invest in a success story. Mm -hmm. And that's also a big key. Again, Jeff can go say some great things, but if we don't have the numbers to back that thing, funders are going to start to question it. And so that's where your grants management person comes into play. Database management. You need a strong database, and you need someone who understands databases to manage that. It's critical to acknowledging and processing your gifts. You've got to get out a timely thank you note. Your CEO isn't going to do that. You need someone who's going to be on top of all that. And frankly, in a small org, this can be one great person or two. I'm not saying you need to build a 15-person team, because I recognize that's a luxury many people in this room probably don't have. But if you can find one or two strong folks to do that work, you are so far ahead of the game. And then building those partnerships with your teams within your organization is going to be critical. Because if you can get someone to a great site visit, I won't spend too long on that. I can have a side conversation with anyone who's interested in how to put on a fantastic site visit. You've got them. And again, your work speaks for itself. You don't need to have the dynamo that is Jeff Canada if you can get folks to see the work in action. I'll stop there. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I, I hope you heard the team. And each part of that team is critical uh, if you're really going to go out and try and raise significant money. By the way, we had to raise this money every year. We had to raise $30, $40 million every year. Every year. So we're talking about a process uh, that allows you to build an organization that can do that on a regular basis. Uh, Teresa, you have a strategy for helping us as a field that, that uh, you uh, decided that you would agree to uh, sort of take what you have learned and share it. In particular, you've targeted some folks. Can you just say a little bit about that? Sure, yeah. So uh, what I realized after spending one year during the pandemic while other people were doing puzzles and making sourdough that I was like not sleeping. Um, and so I realized that, um, you know, with my organizer friends, they're like, you can't help us if you burn out. Like you need to like, we need to do some replication here, right? So a combination of things happened where I um, sort of learned how do I, I work usually on with one organization, how do I communicate to a number of organizations? How do I scale um, what I know about things specifically about things like Promise Neighborhoods and full service community schools? But also what we realized is that um, I shouldn't be telling narratives of people who don't look like me. Um, and that we need a deeper bench of grant writers and people who are shaping these proposals that come from communities and identify with communities that have lived experience um, for doing grant writing. So that became a huge norm of what uh, we want to try to pull more folks into grant writing 
exciting. And so do you want me to talk specifically about the cohort yeah, that we're yeah, doing? Okay. Yeah. So um, we um, ran a competition actually the summer of for a, for a full federal grant seeking cohort um, of folks who have an interest in being grant consultants, um, Black Latinx primarily. Um, and we are starting them uh, next month. Um, but we have six folks and I'm going to be working with them over 10 weeks and doing intensive coaching on the Cradled Career Place-based grant writing. Um, and then those, pay, those folks have made a commitment to do grant writing um, nationwide, to do consulting kind of grant writing, not just within one organization. So we just, we'll just keep doing that until I fall over, I guess. <laughs> so I guess. so just, just to be clear, we are training, not we, Teresa, we're training a diverse group of folks who can help you write federal grants uh, at the level that will increase the likelihood of success. Uh, that's the strategy, that you don't have to figure out how to do this. We have promised them, each one, that we're gonna ensure that they have a couple of clients, uh, that they can do this work. Uh, and we found the best person in America we could to help train them. I'm, I'm being serious about that. Uh, so that for those of you who decide to take this next step, which we hope a lot of people are, uh, and apply for federal, you know, the, the thing about federal grants, you have to have a great writer. You don't have to have a great program. <laughs> right? I don't know. Right? <laughs> I, I, I want to make that clear. You all have great programs. You should be getting these grants. Right? So, but if you don't have a great writer, I don't care how good your program is, you are not gonna get one of these federal grants. Uh, and the other side of this, it's getting one, it's a blessing and a curse, because managing them is a whole different issue, right? And a lot of folks get in trouble. But I just wanted to be clear. Uh, now we're gonna go to uh, Andrea, cause I never heard of Enterprise Capital. I am like your biggest fan right now. I wanna go out and just change the world about this. So uh, I'd like you to just say a little bit about that, but also about uh, the kind of work uh, you're doing to help organizations that don't have finance backgrounds really think about what it means to put together a financial structure for their organizations. Great. There's nothing like having Jeffrey Canada as a fan, right? <laughs> like, how do you ever pay for that? Um, so first of all, Finance is not rocket science. In case somebody tries to convince you of that, um, uh, don't believe that. And uh, how many of you know what your mission is? How many of you know what your business model is to achieve that mission? There you go, right? <laughs> believe it or not, you all have business models. You may not call it that. You may call it what it takes to get through the day. <laughs> but that's what you have. And what enterprise capital is about is really how do you provide the fuel that is invested in that net asset account on your balance sheet, right? You can write that down. That is the holy grail that then can be used to invest in all the pieces of your enterprise that is necessary to achieve your mission. So when you just heard from Jen, all the staff you need to really raise $50 million, I'm sure you said, oh my God, I'm never going to raise that. And where is it going to come from? And how do I do that? This is the way you begin to think about, here is our business model. Enterprise capital then is one critical component in really building the equity in your organization. This word was really coined. Many of you may have heard of Clara Miller, who founded the Nonprofit Finance Fund and then was the president of the Heron Foundation. She called it philanthropic equity to really parallel to what happens in the private sector. When I brought this idea up, which had really languished for a decade, and said, let's get back to it because it's so critical, 
given all the issues that are happening around racial equity and all these other things, people just got confused. So this idea of the word enterprise capital really then says, this is the money that goes into the enterprise. But that's not enough, right? You all know, and this is why Teresa's here, that you also need to generate revenue that can keep the ongoing operations together. So how do you figure out how those two pieces work together to then create a sustainable model? You need to figure out what's the financial model that drives your business model. Let's demystify that. So one of the things I'm doing with my partner organization, 20 Degrees, which is a fabulous uh, idea. 20 degrees is the angle at which if you throw a rock, it skips over the water. <laughs> they specialize in revenue generation, is doing a financial assessment and revenue assessment of an organization. So you can understand what is my financial model today and what does it need to be in the future? As an organization, that did an incredible amount of policy, advocacy, and organizing work, we depended tremendously on philanthropy. We had some revenue lines of business during the Biden administration when we ran federal programs. Overnight, I lost it, the minute Trump was elected. Within six months, every program matching the savings of low-income people was eliminated. I had to then completely rethink What's the financial model for today? But yet I had enough data, as we talked about, to be able to figure out how do I adapt that financial model to meet the mission, which is more urgent than ever. So one of the pieces I want to say is that one does not need an accounting degree or a finance degree to really understand how to read your financial statement and how to use it with whoever's on your staff to then plan out your future. And I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about how this happens. But I think providing this kind of related capacity building, and what I want to say very clearly is I focused a lot of my work on raising enterprise capital for organizations led by people of color. And I spent 30 years addressing the racial wealth divide at the household level, and I am seeing the exact divide replicated in the nonprofit sector. And one of the two reasons that I see all the time is, oh, you're too small. Mm. I can't give you this money. You're too small. Working with an extraordinary organization in the Twin Cities that's trying to close the racial wealth divide in home ownership, the biggest disparity in the United States. Oh, your balance sheet is too small. I can't give you the capital. Or the other thing you hear, you don't have enough capacity. That's not what I mean. I mean, let's get targeted capacity that helps you analyze so next time we meet, everybody raises their hand when I ask, do you know what your business model is? Um, so this is, this is, this is one of the challenges uh, in our work is that we're, we're really running small and medium-sized businesses. But that's not what we wanted to do. We wanted to solve a problem, right? And that's what gets us up. No one gets up saying, can't wait to get to my financial statements and you know, <laughs> spend some time. Go. But, but the, the problem with our work, unlike other folks, you can't do this work off $500,000. This is cause for really significant infusions of money over time for you to actually carry out this mission. So there are things about being a business center that we're going to have to incorporate. Uh, and if you're lucky like me, you find folks who know how to do it, and then they just pester you right, to come to the meetings, and, and you just say, yes, 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 I agree. Um, but with, with <laughs> Without that, without that, you can actually undermine your organization, right? You can grow past your ability uh, to sustain. Uh, you cannot have a sustainable plan in place. So we want folks who are on this mission 
uh, to really uh, think as much about this aspect as you are thinking about cradle to career. Uh, how do you build out these enterprises? One of the key areas I think that folks have uh, sort of underutilized uh, is the role of the boards uh, and how they might play a role uh, in fundraising. I'm gonna go to Jen and just say, uh, if you would just say a word about what that looks like, uh, and then I'm gonna come both to uh, Teresa and Andrea to talk about uh, what makes some institutions uh, able to raise huge amounts of capital uh, regardless to the environment, uh, the financial environment we're in. So I'm, I'm going to you, Jen. Thanks, Jeff. So on the board, and again, I know what ours looks like, but I've also worked at places that doesn't look anything like ours. And I think the first thing I would say that's critical is setting expectations of your board. A board's role is primarily to support the fiduciary aspects of the organization, including fundraising. And I recognize that every board will be and should be diverse. Not everyone is going to be your largest donor, but the expectation should be that your organization is the philanthropic priority of each of those board members in whatever way they are able to do so. Not every board member is gonna be an excellent solicitor. There's probably board members you'll think, mm, I don't want that person in an ask. But they can still play a role in fundraising. And I think that's where your development team can hone some really great processes during the course of their year to do that. And you can set those expectations with the board to say, look, philanthropic priority, support in fundraising. And the development team will talk with you about what that support looks like and how you can utilize your network. So a couple things we do I can share quickly. One is our annual benefit. I'm sure most folks in this room run an, at least one annual benefit a year. We use that as an opportunity for myself, my director of major gifts, to meet with every trustee. During that meeting, we talk with them about their network. We bring a list, and this is where that infrastructure, prospect research, proactive planning is so critical. So we enter that meeting with a list that we've shared in advance. Some of them are folks we know they know. Some of them are folks we think they may know. It can seem a little like, oh, why do you know that about me? But that's okay. They, they appreciate that you've done the work. And that gets them really excited to say, oh, I can help in this way. And for those folks on your board, some may say, great, I'm happy to solicit these folks on the list. Others may say, mm, I'm not comfortable asking them for money, but I'm gonna invite them to join me at my table. And from there, you set a strategy to say, okay, who came? Would well, you like to follow up with them? Shall we follow up with them? And you get them there for a visit. And at that point, the trustee could bow out entirely if that's kind of the level of their comfort, but they've already done a huge service to your development team and to your organization. And the second piece is just really emphasizing in all of your board meetings the importance of fundraising. What is needed for the organization to thrive and how everybody can play a part, not just your fundraising committee. And I think that's a big piece too. It's oftentimes board members will say, oh, that's the committee's job. They've got this or the board chair has this. But so everyone feels when they join a board, they know what the expectations are and they can find a place to be helpful. Site visits are the most tremendous opportunity for board members to feel engaged. It's so simple to invite someone up. I want you to come see this amazing work that this organization I spend my time on is doing. Lastly, on a solicitation standpoint, best practice is that nobody should be asking someone for something they haven't done themselves. So you wanna ensure if you do have a board that is willing to solicit, that they've made that personal investment before they go into a room and ask somebody else to do something similar. Ideally, they're asking at the same level, because chances are they're gonna, the person you're asking is gonna ask that board member, so hey, what have you done? And if, if they can't say they've done something similar, you're, you're kind of dead in the water on that ask. And the only, only thing I wanna follow up, I would say probably 70% of our fundraising uh, comes from relationships with board members. Uh, that's not, that I don't have those relationships personally. Uh, and our event is not just to raise revenue, it is. It is to constantly, every year, uh, give the team an opportunity to ask board members, who else can you introduce to the organization? Who else can we bring there? Who else can you invite to sit at your table? So that even if they're not giving, you want folks to have the experience. And after a while, folks come a number of times, and you know what, they end up deciding, hey, I should probably support these folks. So this is, I think, again, just a strategy that's in place. Uh, if you're not doing something like that, you should. You don't have to spend a lot of money often to get these things done. Sometimes a board member can open up their uh, place and you can invite people over. But this is, this is constant. I would, I would say that, uh, you know, Jen and her team are generating ideas 
on, it feels like a daily basis. I know it's not daily. We're just saying, why don't we think about this? Why don't we think about that? Which frees us up to go out and think about program and not worry about the, the machine running behind the organization thinking about fundraising all the time. So, uh, Teresa, there are places that raise large amounts of federal, state, and other money on a day in and day out. I mean, every year, regardless, uh, when you hear that federal budget every year gets allocated, there are people who actually have been living off of those budgets for decades. What, what is it, what, what do they do? Uh, what allows them to be successful in going in year after year uh, and getting federal dollars uh, to flow into uh, their organization. Sure. Well, and I think it, it really does speak to the connecting to the board conversation around sort of um, that we talked about complacency and the, the danger of complacency. And the thing that I like about federal grants is it gives a deadline and a container for decision making. So it offers, um, you know, I talk a lot about sort of reformers and revolutionaries and the scaffolding between that. Reformers are normally the folks on your board. They're agitators. They have levers of power. Revolutionaries want to burn it down and start over. I have no investment in the current system, but we need both. Um, to move forward and you are in a position and the pe people who get grants are in the position to both do collective impact in the data management and the financial management, but they have the trust and relationships of network weavers in the communities, and you are in that position. Um, and so that is the sort of striking, and, and grants offer an opportunity for um, very focused decision making. It's parameters around sort of what are the outcomes that we're going to achieve, what is the timeline in which we're going to attempt to do it. Um, and I think right now, too, I'm going to put a plug in for the two grants that are due in September for Promise Neighborhoods and Full Service Community Schools. In in addition to putting in proposals that communicates to those appropriators and to those agencies that these programs work and that people are wanting this funding and that will be something that will have a longer term arc impact as well. But I will say on the ground, it's the folks who can connect those two pieces of, um, of reformers and revolutionaries in a way that um, in that container of the federal funding um, again and again. And I think you know if you wanna get in that game, I think if you're interested and you see an organization that tends to get all of the federal funding, there's several things you can do to get into that and one if you become a partner I will say that with grant seeking if you've got somebody who's been getting federal grants over and over they need you more than than you need them right like they need new partnerships they need to be they need to refresh their 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 model they need to reach new communities they haven't touched. Um, and so inviting and getting yourself into those kind of conversations. Also, be a reviewer this summer. Um, if you are not putting in a Promise Neighborhoods or Force Service Community Schools, um, sign up to be a reviewer and you'll learn everything you want to know about that process and the way that it works internally. Um, and so um, those are the two things I would recommend immediately. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna have the, the last question. Um, hopefully I have a couple of questions we can take from the audience to Andrea. I, I, when we started our capital campaign and our endowment campaign, a lot of folks didn't want to give. So we don't do that uh, to the Harlem Children's Zone. But what I found was that they did it to their colleges, their universities, and I was like, what, what is it about us that makes us so we shouldn't be able to have access to this money, but the most privileged, powerful places in the country who are serving the most privileged people in America that they, every year, they get, so how do we change that dynamic? Because I think it's, just, it's not just we're not asking, it's there's a, a bunch of folks who for some reason don't think we're, we're deserving of that kind of capital. What, what's your thoughts on that? So we also haven't talked about my reparations scheme mm -hmm. for how we take part of the endowments of the Ivy Leagues and give them to the HBCUs. Yeah. Right. Yes. I told you, see, you, you, you heard I didn't bring that up, but <laughs> we're supporting the work. And as alumni of two Ivy League schools, I say that very proudly, yeah. right? So um, here's a big secret. Um, I did a webinar with the Federal Reserve on this topic and one of my friends who everybody from Louisville knows, who's the funniest person on the planet, calls me up and she goes, I know what the problem is. She says, foundations have one product. That product is money. They think their product is program, but they don't know how money works. And many of the foundations I'm working with have been very honest that some of their program officers don't even know what a balance sheet is. So 
One of our tasks of changing this dynamic, Jeff, is we need to help program officers, most of whom are incredibly interested in this, once I get over their fear of finance with them, of understanding how they increase the return on investment of their own funding by providing funding in the right way. And that's the piece that we need to work on together. How does providing the kind of capital that helps you achieve your mission in the best way, not having to reverse engineer what you do, right? If everybody knows what that is, oh, I will only give you money if you do this, even though that's not what your business model is. And if you think anybody, anybody is excluded from that, I saw a webinar with Brian Stevenson, who has more power than Jeffrey Canada, <laughs> Brian Stevenson. And he was commenting, well, one of my funders just said, you've got to change your business model to get this grant. So I said, never mind. Mm -hmm. And I thought, if that even happens to Brian Stevenson. Mm -hmm. So I think a big piece of it, Jeff, is we need to be able, and this is where our investment comes in, to really be able to document the outcomes and the impact of having this kind of capital and how it not only helps us achieve our mission, but their mission. And how without it, we are not going to get there. So Logan shows me his financial statements. From the time he began the investment, he had 1.3 million in net assets. Today he has 55. Mm. It is a completely transformative experience knowing what to ask for and how to ask for it. And one of the schemes that Teresa and I are cooking up over here, and Jeff raised this, is how do we think about getting, not all federal funding, mm -hmm. but some, to work like enterprise capital itself? Yep. So, I mean, this, the, the idea of this morning is we just, we, we want you to want more, mm -hmm. right? To, to even know to ask for more. You know, I spent most of my career asking for slightly less money than I needed to run programs, right? Because I couldn't ask for all the money I needed to run. I didn't think they'd give me that. So I thought if I get 80%, 70%, I never thought of enterprise capital. I just never even thought you could ask a funder for that kind of money, uh, even though it would have made all the difference in the world. So uh, we have only a couple of minutes, but I wanted to at least try and, and take a couple of questions that you all might have for this panel. Great. Uh, we, have, we have some mics. A mic is coming, and then I saw a hand in the back also. Hi, I'm Ashley Phillips. I'm from Impact Tulsa in Tulsa. And my question is, it struck me when you said don't have board members ask for that which they haven't contributed. So I just think about, oh, they have money. How are you engaging people who are maybe more proximate to the issues, are they on the board or do you utilize them elsewhere? Because that's something we get pushed. How, are, how is there more representation on our boards? And, and I think this is, this is the role of how a board needs to be structured. Mm -hmm. Because everybody on the board is not going to be sort of a rainmaker for money. And there are folks who are going to have a different kind of uh, both sort of community and technical expertise that you might need. But what I would encourage you is to, and I have found a lot of folks specialize in that. We specialize in making sure we have folks who can also help us gain access to the resources out there. And I think it's really a balance of the board. And folks, look, there are some racial and some gender issues that come into play, when, and folks get scared of that. Uh, but uh, I think our job uh, as leaders is to make sure we have sufficient resources over time to do the work. And I think the board can play a role. So I don't think you need to think every board member is going to play the same role. That's not the case. But someone, you know, I, I tell folks, George is here, George and I are from the same community. We grew up, we were poor. So we can't go to our friends and get anything, <laughs> right? They're asking us for money. As far as they're concerned, we're the richest people they know. Right? So who opens up that world to you? That's what I'm saying. Who opens up that world to you? And how do you get those folks to be part of this moving forward? OK, uh, I saw another question. Yes, yeah, so sort of along the same lines, is that for a small nonprofit that can attract those folks that have those connections and community, but then also that balance between having people on your board that care about what you're doing and have that passion for what you're doing versus somebody bringing in somebody that just 
that really does have those connections but don't really necessarily connect to, to that, how do, you, how do you navigate that sort of situation with just sort of the common everyday folks, if you will, on your board that care a lot about what you're doing? Great question. You want, you want, anyone can take a, take a shot at answering that. I can jump in. I, I think, as Jeff said, I think there's those priorities. And I would also say on our board, folks who may not look like the people you would think would be connected are deeply connected. And I think that is also the work of the team is to create those connections early on as you see people that you want to join the board. Um, and Jeff can speak far more to this than I can, but HCZ, when it became HCZ, completely changed the board because of the goals of the organization and the realization that the board in place was not going to get us to where we needed to be. And those were not easy conversations, but they happened. And I, I wanna, and, and unfortunately it's our last question because I see we're already running over, but I wanna, I wanna answer your question, uh, I think a little more directly. You're thinking my profile's not high enough to attract the kind of folks that have access to that kind of uh, money and resources. And that is a part of a development strategy. When Jennifer was talking about building the team, the question is how do you build a presentation that will capture the imagination of folks who might otherwise be thinking, I'm really interested in the art museum and I'm not necessarily interested in, and that is a strategy. And I want, I want you all to understand you think that one comes before the other. The strategy to do that work comes first. Executing on it. People think, well, yeah, you know, Jeff, you became sort of famous, everybody joined. It's absolutely not true. It is absolutely. We spend an inordinate amount of money trying to attract folks, trying to convince folks to come on the board, and then once they're on the board, to actually play the role that we want them to play. I mean, this is a, a part of an effort that I think folks don't understand. Uh, it's the work of a team. Uh, to get this done, and uh, I've been places where folks say, well, we just don't have access. There's a lot more access. Uh, you go in your t city, you tell me there's not one museum, there's not one university, there's not one hospital that's raising. So I say, okay, maybe there's not money in your community. They, they, they exist. Access is a totally different thing, and I'm gonna just say this. It's the hardest thing I learned in this business. If you don't ask, you don't get. And if you, if you get offended when people tell you no, don't go into development, right? I'm, I'm just being serious. All of us are high achievers. We want folks to like us. You know, people don't think they say no. Yeah, they say no to me plenty. What I have learned is say, okay, no, go ask again. Go ask somebody else, right? And it's almost a privilege to be told no. Yes, I ask. You, you would be shocked at some of the things I've asked for that folks have been very clear. No, we're not doing that. All right, it's okay. That's okay. They don't hate me for asking. I've never had anybody say, I'm never talking to Jeff again because he asked me for more money than I wanted to give him, right? That's just not how this thing goes. So part of it is um, we don't, we don't want to ask. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that we don't want to beg people for money. I got it. I got it. And I tell folks who think I'm a big shot, you would be embarrassed if you saw me kissing the ring and all the other body parts I have to do, <laughs> right, to raise money. It is what it is, right? I'm just being honest. People be like, ooh, Jeff. I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm just saying, but, but what I always ask myself is what comes first? Does the, the mission of my children and families come higher than my ego. And, and that's a challenge. It's not always yes, by the way. It is a challenge, but in development, uh, you've got to be prepared to balance that. So look, I think we've had a terrific, wait, by the way, uh, we have uh, decided to have contractual relationships with this group on behalf of the field uh, because we really want to build this up, all right? So let's give them a hand. Uh, more to come, all right? Thank you all very much.